everyone, and welcome to Brunology, the fusion of beer and knowledge, episode 2. I'm your host, Dean Winch, and with me today is Jason Johnson. How you doing, Jason? I'm doing all right. Yeah? Anything new to report back this week? Not this week. Not brewing related. I haven't, I haven't had too much going on this week at all. No. How about you? Well, yeah, actually I did a couple of things. I took a amber that I made, and I, I realized I, I had done crashing and, and everything, and it's, it's ready to go, so I spent Wednesday night putting it in a keg, cleaning up my equipment afterwards, and I think it turned out a little more astringent than I, than I care for, but I mean, I hit my gravity numbers. In fact, I, I, I actually over attenuated it. It came She's out a little dry. Came out a little dry, little, little harsh. Um, hoping it's going to smooth out with a little bit of age, but it's not overly terrible. It's just not as good as the first example I made. Well, sometimes you never know until after you get it carbonated and get it in the keg and let it sit for a little while, it will mellow out a little bit, and maybe we should uh, sample that on uh, the next couple of weeks. Oh, you think so? Huh? I think so. You think we're going <laughs> to sample home, sample our own home brews, huh? Why not? Yeah, well, I guess. People can always send us beer, though. I mean, Absolutely. If you want to if you want to send beer, yeah, well, just hit us up at uh, info at uh, brunology.com yeah. and let us know if you want to send some beer, and we'll hook you up with the address to send to, and we will review your beer on the air. Yeah. I mean, don't don't barrage us with, with too much. I mean, we're going to try and keep it simple here, but, I mean, hold back and refrain, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then uh, last night I went and put a, a cream ale that I had made um, from the Manti Malters competition, the, the recipe for that. I went ahead and I took a first gravity reading, final gravity reading on that. That one came out, I have never, I've never done this, that one came out at a perfect one. At a, a one? A one. A one? one point zero zero zero. Ooh, that's going to be really dry. No, it's not. Are you sure your hydrometer is not off a little bit? Because like one, that's water. Yeah, it it's a little light. It's not dry. It's not as sweet as I wanted. And the color did get a little light on me. So... It's, you know, it's probably not going to be great, but... That's another one we could sample here. <laughs> that one's not even in the in the keg yet. Come on. Oh, all right, all right. It's like robbing the cradle here. True. Um, no, so that's that's pretty much my brewing news. I'm, I'm going to probably try and, and whip up either a... Uh, I haven't decided if I want to do a southern English brown or a northern English brown or just a nut brown. I've got the stuff at home to make either of which, so... Well, I am thinking this weekend, hopefully, if not this weekend, sometime in the next coming week, I'm going to be brewing a rye uh, IPA, and I have a lot of uh, mosaic, citra, and horizon hops that I'm going to be using in that. And I looked in my chest freezer, and I've got some vacuum-packed hops. Oh, very nice. So I might have to adjust my recipe and see if I can use those. I didn't actually look at what the hops are that are in there. Are they whole leaf or are they pellet? They're all pellet. Oh, so you know what the alphas are and stuff. I'll know what the so. alphas are, but I, yeah, I, I believe I might have summit in there, and I'm not a huge fan of summit because that always comes across a little garlic and onion to me. Yeah, that one, especially if it's this year's hop, I've no, or this or last year's 2014's choice, I've noticed that that one did come off a little garlicky. Yeah, I've so, got some in my freezer too at home, and I noticed the same thing when I used it. No, I just went in there to get some tuna steaks, and I saw, oh, there's some hops in here. Might have to add those to my IPA to. But we'll see. We'll see what they are, and we'll see if they'll fit in with the with the mosaic and the and the. Um, well, if you use them for if you use them for bittering, maybe I mean, and then you can take your mosaic and your citrus and throw them in. You know, ten minutes, fifteen minutes left in the boil. I think you balance all nicely. Yep. But it, my plan was that's what the horizon was for. Yeah. So we'll have, I'll have to see. We'll have to yeah. maybe play with it. Maybe I won't use them at all. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, you're going to use Beersmith, right? So. Beersmith. Yep. yep. So always using Beersmith. Always using Beersmith. I mean, that's a great uh, online tool to make sure you get your stuff right. So, yeah. What do you say? Uh, How about we get get rolling? Get rolling. What you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, we can do some more banter at the pub later. That's fine. <laughs> let's uh, have some wings after this. Oh, sounds tasty. But um, yeah, we can get started. Uh, the first thing I wanted to cover was a little bit on on what guidelines we're going to be using for this show because I'm not sure if we covered that a lot last uh, in the last episode. We are going to be using the 2015 style guidelines throughout this entire show, mostly because that is the direction that most of the competitions and the exams are going to be going from here on out. As a matter of fact, the final quarterly exam for the people that have to take the written exam is going to be on October 18th of this year, 2015, for taking the written exam. I'm going to be uh, attempting to take that written exam again to boost my score, if possible. Uh, it's, it's a very tough exam to take, uh, the written one, so I'm a little nervous about how I'm going to do, but 
We'll see. You never know unless you try it. And I know on the same day you're going to be taking your tasting exam. Yeah, we get very fortunate being here where we are that we have a, uh, I mean, with October 18th being the, the cutoff guideline, we have October 17th, that Saturday, we'll be uh, down in Milwaukee taking each of our exams. Right. So it, it's it's close to the cutoff, and I think it's... it's and we get to hit some good beer bars after, so oh, that's a big plus. Yeah, we're going to have something back to report on for that, that's for sure. So if you're used to using the 2008 guidelines, there are a few changes that you're going to notice. Uh, we'll cover those a lot more as we're progressing through the show. Just give us an overview for now. Yeah, mostly what you're going to see is there's been a lot of additions to style, to various styles. There's been a lot of, of additions, uh, a lot of historical styles that have become popular over the past couple of years, things like uh, the Goza or the other ones, some other ones I can't pronounce, but there's a lot more historical styles. There's been uh, expansions into the ever-famous IPA category, where you have more than just American IPA or Imperial IPA or English IPA, because now you're, you're going into the uh, descriptions of the Red IPA, the Black IPA, the White IPA, Session IPA, and all of those are explained. There are a lot more uh, expanded explanations of a lot of the styles to reflect changes in ingredients that have happened over the past several years. A prime example would be all of the hops that are coming from uh, like Australia or New Zealand where you're getting a lot of these really popular melon, stone fruit type of, of hop flavors and aromas. There, there haven't been quite so many changes to the classic examples, but they do clarify some terms. And I, I hate to keep going back to uh, IPA, because I know a lot of people are sick and tired of hearing about IPA. It is but, getting a little overwhelming. But it is, it's a, it's a good category to look at, because there's a lot of changes that happened in there, where previously the, the verbiage has said that it should reflect American hop varieties, mostly of the cit- citrus or pine type of hop flavor and aroma, but, and it said, but it doesn't necessarily have to uh, apply. The problem they were having in the competitions was a lot of judges would look and see if it had to be, you know, a citrus or piney, and if it wasn't, it was out of style, even though there were other hops coming through that were, you know, stone fruit or, or tropical fruity, and they just changed the verbiage. You'd get they, a ding for it if you didn't, so. you yeah, they would They would ding you, and, yeah. and you know, that's part of that comes from people are looking for their favorite IPA that they've had. And they're expecting every beer to come across the table to be basically a clone of what they think is the quintessential IPA. And that's that's one thing we're trying to do with Brunology is help educate people in that style guidelines are a range. You're not these competitions, or even if you're brewing to a specific style, be it uh, Oktoberfest or whatever, you're brewing in a range. You're not trying to clone a specific beer from Germany. You're trying to hit a range. One other change in the 2015 guidelines is that they're geared a lot more towards international judges and competitions. They're realizing that it's not just the U.S. anymore that is hosting these homebrew competitions. Homebrewing is very popular all around the world now, and they're holding competitions, and they're sanctioning judges, and these guidelines are also meant to reflect those styles that are popular in other countries. Well, and you can even pick that up, too. I mean, I just I just grabbed the 21A category, which is the... 2015 IPA category and and like you said earlier they broke it down really nice and they did a lot of stuff with it you, you see that 21B has seven or eight different beers in it now as opposed to just where in the past you would see 21A you'd see 21B and you'd have one style here and one style here and one style C and one style in D you've got a Belgian specialty IPA in the right. same 21B category as 21B brown IPA Yep. So well, previously, that Belgian would have been in 16e. Anything Belgian that specialty goes in 16e. Right, which is way too vague. Right. So I, mean, I think they, I think what they tried to do is good, and I know everybody's freaking out a little bit over it. I mean, well, it's because it's, it's what we've been using for years. Right. So and I mean, change is hard. It changes hard, but appreciate the change. Take a look at what they were trying to do, and just look at the bigger picture, and we'll we'll get through it. I mean, everything everything changes. We'll we'll get through it. Yep. Uh, there are also some changes into the categories. You know, a good example is standard American beer, which, you know, that first category previously was all your American light lager, your Budweiser clones, all those, those, those tough beers that are difficult to make as a homebrew, but people don't necessarily enjoy. Right. But they're testing their skills. But a lot of times in competitions, you didn't have enough of those to really fill a category. So you would have those beers going up against things like cream ale 
And what they did is they tried to consolidate those light styles together uh, by region or something else. So that first category, standard American beer, includes your your standard American lager, your pre-prohibition lager, your cream ale, those type of beers. Well, it, it's got your cream ales, your wheat beers, your American lagers. I mean, your light uh, it's lagers. It's got American wheat in there, too? Yeah, it's got American yeah. wheat beer, tw- uh, 1D. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, pre-prohibition, I believe that fell back to... Uh, I believe that fell back to historical. Um, that might have. Yeah, because the, pre- the the historical beer style, you have, uh, well, like you said earlier, you've got a lot of names in there that I can't pronounce. There are there are a lot of uh, that's that that's that whole international thing. I don't consider myself a wordsmith by any standards, but I mean, you've got Kentucky Common, you've got Lichten Air, London Brown Ale, Piwo Gradsky, Pre-Prohibition Lager, Pre-Prohibition Porter. Roggen beer and Sadi. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff in there that number one wasn't even in 2008. And, right. And so it's it, and it was difficult when they would come into competition. Say somebody somebody enters a uh, uh, you know Goza or something like that, and we didn't know what those were. Yeah. And you would either have to you know if you had a phone you were able to Google it and try to find out what it is, but now those are all laid out for you. So, I mean, I think I think it's good what they're trying to do. And they, they also geared these guidelines a lot more towards the entrance as well. They're, the descriptions are a little better. They have a style comparison to help a person uh, that might be on the fence on, you know, is this a robust porter, is this a brown porter, or whatever. And, and they, they go through some style comparisons in these guidelines to help you try to decide where this beer fits a little better. And the verbiage is a lot more detailed. So I, I do like that a lot more, that the verbiage is more detailed. Yeah, I agree. I was personally one of the proponents of 2008 for as long as I possibly could. and I was, too, till I really started looking at these. And yeah. then I'm like, oh, it kind of makes sense now. A lot of these a lot of these styles that are being covered, a lot of people didn't know what they were. And you were basically winging it. A lot of the times, it's just being like, I don't know what this is. Do I like it or not? That was it. And now you have a guideline to actually help you yep. zero in on what it should be. Um, the other thing I want to I want to emphasize with that though is know your guidelines. I know the last competition that we judged at, there was an entrant that put a beer in that was in. I believe it was the, I don't know if it was the brown categories or if it was the. You remember what that was, Jason? I don't. But it was it was a. I remember we judged together, but I don't remember it specifically. Was, it was not about. a very well-made example. Was that the cream ale that was really dark and really malty, like 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 caramel malt? Yes. And it was, yeah. and it was entered into the um, specialty beer or the the, the 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 problem with the 2015 guidelines is there's one category uh, that's extremely vague, and it's called specialty beer. Oh, yeah. So. Specialty beer is vague, right? But and it's it's vague because it covers everything, and, and that's exactly right. But when you're entering a beer into the specialty beer category and you put it in 34C for experimental beer, how do you even judge that? Well, first of all, I mean we'll get to that through our our, our stuff. But just a quick rundown is you have to explain what's experimental about it. Did you use a special uh, sugar or a special process that is not used normally, or what or, or is there a combination of ingredients, be it fruit and spice, or fruit and wood, or spice and wood, that would cover under specialty or experimental? Uh, if it if you're just entering a cream ale in there because it's dark and caramely, that's not really experimental. That's out of style. Right. You need to be able to specify what about that beer is experimental, and that's where it comes in. All of those specialty categories you do have to put in special ingredients or process of what you used. And if you don't do a good job of doing that, and you just say, well, this is a cream ale that's dark, well, that's kind of not a very good description to choose. And I think, I think, that's, I think that's where I was going with that, was, was the, now that you've jogged my memory a little more, yeah, the, I, I believe that was the cream ale, and it was a little dark. And, and, you know, all you can do is offer your feedback at that point and, and do the best you can to try and help the brewer make a better beer next time. And, and offer up a suggestion yeah. on this yeah. this. This isn't really a specialty beer because you didn't use any special ingredients. You didn't use a special process. It's just it was out of style. You made a cream ale, and either your boil got away from you, or your green bill got away from you, or something, and, and 
You just thought, eh, I'll enter it in the specialty, specialty beer. Eh, right. why not? It, it probably would have fit a lot better in one of the different categories. Uh, I, just going off memory, I don't recall what that would be, but... Yeah, I'd have to look at my... There's, there's a lot of styles. I'm sure it would have fit in better than just specialty. I'd have to look at my notes, but yeah. Well, we are also going to be covering beer styles throughout, throughout this uh, podcast. So that's what we're going to start with today. Uh, I know last week we didn't do the best job of covering English barley wine. I apologize for that. Yeah, it's it's a learning curve as far as doing this verbally uh, through a microphone as compared to just just uh, doing it on a, on a score sheet and things like that. So what what we're going to do is we're going to try and do things a little better. We're going to we're going to sample this uh, Oktoberfest that Dean has brought, and Dean's going to explain a little bit about the style. And we're gonna we're gonna discuss this, and we're gonna try and make it a little more smooth and a little bit more in depth than we did last time. We're gonna try. That's the key word here. We're gonna try. We're learning. We're learning. We're learning so, how to do this. And, and again, feedback at brunelg.com if you have changes. Yeah, if you have any, if you have any, any uh, good, bad advice or, for us, good, bad, or indifferent, we'll take it all at this point. Yep. The Oktoberfest for sampling is the 2015 Sierra Nevada Oktoberfest that they have this year. I hope it's the 2015 from this year, not the 2015 from last year. Well, we could get caught in the time warp. You never know. <laughs> I mean, who knows who's listening to us? I mean, this could reach space. We don't know. True. Uh, um, yeah, the it's actually a festival lager. It is brewed in collaboration with Bruhaus Regal in Augsburg, Germany. It's a fall seasonal, one-time only brew. Well, the fest style tells us that it should be a lighter Oktoberfest and not one of the darker Correct. versions because it's a it's a fest beer. Correct. So, basically. but you still have to treat it as a six A Marzen Correct. style. It, so. it still needs to fit. It needs to fit in the range, but it can fit in the lower end of all of the the, the range for the style. Correct. Uh, sampling this, <laughs> my my bad. Well, I get I get a little bit of a, a rich, toasty malt aroma, but what's kind of really What's really getting me in here is there is a, definitely a solid spicy hop aroma to yeah, it. I'm picking that up as well. It, it's uh, it's low, but it's definitely there. And, and It's there for sure. And in the style, I mean, it's, according to the style guidelines, it's not supposed to be there. So yeah, you're right. There, no, not in the no aroma. aroma. Not in the aroma. No aroma. Correct. I'm getting mostly malt, though, in the aroma. That's pretty good. It's 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 almost like a, a toasty toasty bread crust. It's clean. I don't. I don't get any fruity esters or, or other fermentation characteristics. I don't, I don't no, know about you. No, I, I. I mean, I'm picking up a little bit of graininess, uh, picking up a little bit of bready. I'm not picking up any esters. Just a, maybe a hint of toasty, mm-hmm. but more bready and grainy than anything else. With that, that slight spice to the hops. That's kind of throwing me off a little bit. Yeah, that hop, I, as pleasant as it is, it's I, it's nice. Per the guidelines, you know, if we're really critiquing this beer against the guidelines, as we should be in in a competition, or if you were aiming to make a traditional Oktoberfest uh, at home, even if you weren't going to enter it in a competition, but your goal was to do a, a solid example, it should not have any any hop aroma, and, and this has some. Yep. So that's something you would you would fault it for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. The the appearance. I mean, what do you what do you think of the color of this one? Well, I think this is a. It's definitely a deep gold. It's not really a, an amber, but it's a it's a dark gold. It has a nice moussey, off white head. Yep. It didn't last, but it is it is very clear. Yeah. Uh, the, but I think overall the appearance is nice. I, I wish the head would last a little bit longer, but it wasn't as as tall as it should be either. It should be a little taller. I mean, it was only quarter inch. I mean, there wasn't much there to it at all. I would have liked to see a little taller head on it. I would have liked to have seen it last a little okay. longer. It was a nice off-white color. The beer is crystal clear. I mean, it's brilliantly clear. I'm not seeing a flaw in the color or in the, the clarity whatsoever. The color, I think, is a little is a little light. I would like to see it a little a little more ambery. I'd like to see a little you, more. Even for a fest beer? Well, for a fest beer, it's fine. But I'm just going with overall. Okay. okay. You know, as far as what what I would personally like to see out of one that's within style guidelines, I would like to see it just a little darker. Sure. What about uh? Flavor. What are you getting for flavor here? I'm hops. picking up that hop. Yeah, it's there's definitely some spicy hops in there. It's also moderately bitter for me. I don't know where you're falling in, but the bitterness is is a little high. It's not in the low range. It's uh, in the in, more in that medium. Uh, it is crisp and toasty for me, for sure. Yeah, it's it's there. I mean, it, that's that's my problem with it. Is is there are there is according to the guidelines there is 
hop bitterness can be moderate and the hop flavor can be low to none. So it's allowed, but I think with what they tried to do with the green bill and the hops, they're, they're definitely noble hops. I mean, let's get that out there. They're definitely a noble hop. I'm guessing Tetnanger. Or some derivative. Or of, some derivative of it. Of something. Yeah, I would agree that because it's, it's a spicy hop aroma for sure yeah. and flavor. Yeah. But it's, I'm, it, pick, I'm picking up some, you know, the hops, the hops and the malts are working, but it's, it's malty, it's bready. It's got a dry, dry finish for me. It, it does. Yeah. It's, it, it starts a little sweet, but it, I mean, not overly sweet, but it, there's a little sweetness to it. And it definitely finishes dry, but that's as it should. And that's as it should. That's in the style guidelines. The, uh, I think the ferment is clean. I think it's crisp, dry. I, I, I think the flavor is, is pretty good. I mean, it's not great, but I think it's pretty good. Yep. One thing to note, though, is in, is in Oktoberfest, are we looking for anything to be caramel-like? No. Or not, overly biscuity? No, not in this. Because a lot of people will say, oh, this Oktoberfest is nice and caramely. No, no, you should not be detecting caramel in your Oktoberfest. Um, most people's perception of caramel will come with the the color and the the sample that they have in their hands, and the, that toastiness sometimes people confuse with with um, with with caramel. Caramel, yeah, right. absolutely. But this doesn't this doesn't have any indication of that. This is this is well done when it comes to that okay. particular asset. Well, I, I, I also find this beer to be medium bodied. It has a, a medium or moderate level of carbonation. There's no astringency. Uh, there's there's a moderate amount of creaminess about you know right in that medium range. I don't get any alcohol warmth or anything out of this. I picked this up beer. a little bit of warmth at the end. You did, but that could be in my palate. That could be a balance of the hops and the warmth. I mean, because a little bit of warmth, I believe, is allowed when it comes to to, to mouthfeel. Sure, it could be slightly warming, even, but it's, I mean, it's supposed to be hidden. But I am picking up some warmth on it, so it it could be. The balance of the of the warmth and the hops, the spicy hops. So overall, where where are you falling in your in your feedback, your your thoughts about this beer, your your overall score out of fifty? The uh, the overall impression I got on this, I, th- I thought it was a very good example of style, fest style or, or standard style. You know, either way, it falls into that six A. I thought it was a very good example of style. It was clean, brilliant, clear. Again, I'm going back to the color. I thought the color was a little light. I know it's fast, but it has to go in that same category. And for me, it should be a little darker. So uh, overall, I gave it a 36 out of 50. Oh, okay. I also gave it a 36. I thought it was a very good example. My main takeaways from this beer, if I was to make some suggestions, was going to be to reduce the hot profile, especially in the aroma, more so than the flavor, if there was any way to eliminate any later edition hops that they may have had. Maybe uh, move them forward a little bit to reduce uh, some of the aroma. That was my main takeaway was there was just there was too much hop aroma for this style. And that's what kept it, uh, for me, from getting into the excellent at world-class range was anytime a, a style says that something is not allowed and it has it, while it's technically not a brewing flaw, it is a stylistic flaw. So that needs to be pulled out to the very good range because that very good range says generally within style with some minor flaws, and that minor flaw would be there's too much hops. Now let me ask you this. Let me answer it. Hops in beer. How are you going to pull off a beer with no hop aroma? That's where the difficulty comes <laughs> in. Uh, you you, you got to do either all 60-minute uh, or 90-minute boil and cross your fingers and, and hope that your, your balance comes out well between your, your IBUs, and you can have a little bit of flavor, but you want to drive off as much aroma as you can. And remember, when you're fermenting, any time that you're driving CO2 out of your carboy, your bucket, your conical, whatever you have, that aroma's leaving. So hopefully you're getting some hop aroma coming out of your carboy or whatever. You know, that's the best you can do. It doesn't mean that this beer is bad. No, no. No, but I, I just that, find it interesting that we all have hops in our beer. Yep. And... This is supposed to have no hop aroma. It's difficult, but it's, yet you're supposed. But yet you can have it in the the flavor. Right. So brewing should be challenging, shouldn't it? I think for the most part. I think if you want a challenge, try and brew. Generally it. speaking. Try, yeah, generally <laughs> speaking. If you really want to have a challenge, make a Marsen. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, you get that. Try to get it without any hop aroma. I mean, I wouldn't make that your first attempt at at home brewing, but you can if you want. Some people out there are that good. I am not. I thought it was very well done. Enjoyed it. That said, I think we've uh, killed that. Yep. Are we ready to move on to our technical topic of the month? 
I suppose. Technical topic of the month is going to be the boil and why we boil our beer. Because we like to warm up in the wintertime? We like to warm up in the wintertime. We like to kill a little bit extra time outside in the garage or, or yeah. spend a little bit more time brewing. Because our significant others don't mind us being out of they the... They don't mind it at all. No. Oh, okay. Nope. Cool. Nope. Well, then we're doing it for you guys. <laughs> oh. And gals. Well, no, there are actually seven main reasons why you want to boil. Uh, the first reason that we do our boil, and this one is not really geared as much towards the extract brewers. This is mostly for all grain brewers is to denature the mash enzymes. Enzymes, uh, which we'll cover a little bit more in depth in a later episode, are not really living organisms. A lot of people like to consider enzymes as a living organism, but they're not. They're really just proteins that act as a catalyst for chemical reactions. That's really all an enzyme is. An enzyme is a protein. They're normally produced by some sort of biological organism. They're, in our case, they're produced by the grain. But their ability to act as a, as a catalyst for chemical reactions is triggered or deactivated normally by some sort of trigger. In, in our case, we're looking at temperature and the water is going to activate our enzymes, which also the opposite can happen, which is why we boil. We want to denature these enzymes. We want them to stop producing their chemical reaction, which is converting starches to sugars. And the temperature to denature uh, our, the beta amylase enzyme is uh, 158 degrees Fahrenheit, or 70 degrees Celsius. Alpha amylase denatures a bit higher at 176 degrees Fahrenheit, or 80 degrees Celsius. So that's almost right at the boil, but boiling will effectively kill or denature the enzyme activity. You also uh, want to sanitize the wort. Uh, boiling for at least a minimum of 15 minutes will kill almost all microbes that could uh, adversely affect your beer. And that, that, that's good advice for both extract brewers and all grain brewers. Yep. Yeah, that works for both ways. It's the same thing you can use for a sanitation prep when it comes to sanitizing your containers or your equipment. If you don't really want to take the step of, of doing a buying sanitizer or whatever, you can essentially boil. Yep, you could boil. Yeah, yep. and that, it, that'll sanitize your equipment too. It's the same thing as like when you. But then you got to deal with hot equipment. That's the that's well, the issue. That is the issue. But you could use you could use that to do something like a a hop spider, right? Or, or your immersion chiller when you're going to chill your mm -hmm. copper. You're going to take that and you're going to generally put that in your boil with 15 minutes left. You're doing that because you're helping to sanitize the copper at the same time. Right. Exactly. The other purpose of boiling is to reduce wort pH. So you want to reduce that pH from your mash, which was, you know, about 5, 6 to 5, 2, hopefully, if everything was right. And, you, you know, beer is normally in the, in the 4 range, somewhere in there. And boiling, what boiling does, it causes calcium phosphate to precipitate out of uh, solution, which, which in turn will, you know, once you, once you, that calcium phosphate precipitates out of, out of your water, or in this case, out of your wort, it will lower pH. I mean, it'll do the same thing for water. You know, if you have a high pH water, say your water is 8, and it's high in calcium phosphate, you boil that water, it'll precipitate out, and you'll effectively reduce the pH of your water. But some of those, you know, that calcium phosphate is added, you know, you know, during the mash, and so you want to precipitate that out. And that's what, what boiling will do, is help get that, that pH into the proper range. And does that apply to all grain and extract, or is that more, since it's water-related? It, it does apply a little bit to extract, but it is mostly for all grain brewers. Okay. You're also going to isomerize the hop alpha acids. Uh, isomerization uh, helps helps form and stabilize bitterness, which, which you know, obviously that's what we're mostly looking for in the hops. Uh, but also a, a little less well-known reaction is the, the isohumulones extracted from the hops is also a very good head stabilizer in your beer, which is why a lot of IPAs sometimes have excellent head retention. And that's from the the, the uh, isohumulones that are extracted from the hops during the, the boiling process. And that obviously applies to both extract brewers and all grain brewers. Because we all use hops. Right. The fifth reason we boil is to coagulate proteins, tannins, and, and other compounds that we normally call hot break. And that, that can cause haze in your beer. I mean, it's, it's, it's an aesthetics issue. It's not really going to affect flavor, but everybody wants that nice crystal clear beer when, when it applies. Everybody shoots for it unless you're making a wheat. Right. Or a goose. Right. 
So aside from a solid mash pH, you know, the starting pH should be around around 5.2. And that, that 5.2 area, uh, believe it or not, will also help with the coagulation of those proteins when, when com- coupled in with heat. Uh, because that pH combined with heat helps those proteins, you know, get sucked out of, out of solution. So the more rapidly that you can heat that, that wort up to, you know, your boiling, you're gonna, you're gonna shock those proteins out of solution that combined with a proper pH will help pull even more out. So if you, if you can get a really good, good solid pH in your mash to where it should be and you get a nice fast boil, you're gonna pull a lot of proteins out. And, and in the reverse, if you can get a really fast chill, I know we're talking about boiling, but if you get that fast chill, you get a good cold break coupled in with your hot break, you, you probably won't have to use any finings. You'll end up with a, a nice crystal clear beer in the end, but it's easier said than done yeah, in is. some cases. Well, and, and most people will put, generally speaking, you'll put wharf lock or Irish moss or mm-hmm. something in your 50, last 15 minutes of boil anyways. So right. I, I don't know off that, the top of my head how that construes to boiling if you... It, it, it helps, it helps a, grab hold of those proteins. And, and bring them and, out. It, it basically, like, it, I like to compare it to like uh, you got a friend that's in a fight in the bar, and you got that friend that goes and grabs the friend and pulls him out of the fight. Yep. That's, that's what your Irish moss and your, your wool flock okay. will do. They, they go grab those proteins and pull them out. Uh, another issue with the with the boil, or another another reason you want to boil, is to form melanoidins through uh, Maillard reactions, which a lot of people call it kettle caramelization, and that's what it, that's what they call it, but it's not really caramelization because caramelization of sugars happens as, at a much higher temperature than um, what we're boiling. Than boiling, yeah, yeah, that's that's much higher. But the the Maillard reaction is it's basically a browning reaction between sugar, heat, and oxygen. And that's, that's what's happening in your boil. And this is the same process that will turn bread and toast or, or even your steak. It'll give your steak that nice, uh, that nice rich flavor as opposed to eating a raw steak. So basically what you're doing is you're browning the, sh- you're browning the sugars produced by the mash to various degrees. You know, and, and, and the Maillard reaction applies to both extract and all grain. Absolutely. Yeah. By nature it would. And the final one is what everybody thinks of when they're thinking of the boiling. That's that's one of the main reasons you boil them is that's to drive off volatile compounds like DMS or ketones or other ester-like uh, things that have been produced either during the mash or during the boil. You're driving those off through that steam. You're pushing them out through the kettle. You're getting them getting them out, and so that they're not in your beer. Well, and this generally has more impact on the all grain brewer. Because your extract brewer that's using extract, a lot of those volatile compounds like the esters and the ketones and, and some of the DMS has been driven off already during the malter's boil when they're, when they're creating that extract. There may be a little bit left that you can, that you can push out, but for the most part, you're looking at, uh, this being mostly an all grain issue is, you know, when you did the mash yourself. Well, that's all good stuff to know. Yeah. You covered that very well. The uh, boil is very important. It's a lot more important than people realize. They think it's just to drive off DMS, but there's a lot more going on in your boil I think than just you, driving you off You forgot DMS. one very important point, though, I think. What is that? Back up at the beginning, before you even started discussing anything, you probably should have made a reference back to do not cover your boil. Well, that, yeah, true. That, because That seems to be a huge thing. I mean, that's going to completely kill... 80% of what you're trying to do here. So, well, I, I, I think that comes out to why you would want to drive things off. You know, yeah. I, I guess that comes from the common sense thing, but I, I sometimes am not thinking, uh, I'm not thinking like a newer brewer who's thinking, you know, I cover the boil, it's going to boil, or I cover the pot, it's going to boil faster and it's going to boil harder. You know, I'm thinking from, uh, sometimes I forget that. And yeah, you're right. So you want to make sure that all that stuff comes out of the boil. I mean, it's okay to, to cover your boil when you're trying to warm your water up, right? When you're coming up off of a, off of a sparge, or if you've just added extract or something, and you want to get that back up to boil in that little bit of time there, feel free to cover your pot while you're saving yourself some heat. Especially if you're going to brew out in colder weather, you're going to need every advantage you can possibly get. So, uh, good points, and you know some of that stuff common sense. So, I just thought I'd bring that up. Yep. 
If you have any feedback, please hit us up. I know we've mentioned it before, but feedback at brunology.com. Yeah, we can't. We're doing this for you guys, so we can't, uh, we can't figure it out if you don't let us know. We're just doing the best we can here. Yep. So. Just trying to provide you guys with some information. If you have any questions, if you have questions you'd like us to answer, also send those to feedback at brunology.com, and we will answer those questions. If we don't know the answers ourselves personally, we will seek out that answer from a source, and we will get you a, a solid, credible source on yep. that answer. We know people. We know well, people. you know people. I know you. You know people. So I automatically have a connection. We know people. All right. Well, till next time, uh, we will talk to you guys later. Uh, hopefully, you guys uh, have some happy brewing going on. Yeah. Happy brewing, everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs>